Hello, and welcome to the Prairie Fiber Witch Podcast. I'm Sarah, coming to you from Edmonton, Alberta, on the Canadian Prairies. And um, today is Saturday, December 11th. And it's been a little while. Um, no reason other than um, I've been, I work shifts. Um, and yeah, it's just been busy. Uh, this is my f first weekend in a few weeks uh, where I have the whole weekend off. So I thought I'd record. And I have like a bunch of stuff over here. So I thought I would share things with you. Um, since last time, I have finished three things, including this sweater. This is the... This is a sweater by Sari Nordland called Fleuriste. There you go. Um, and I knit this out of Yarn on the House Best Friend, which is a cotton wool blend. Um, and I held it double throughout to get, because it's kind of a, a fine fingering yarn, so to get gauge. And yeah, I haven't worn this sweater a lot. I haven't quite put buttons on it yet. Um, because uh, the library where I work um, is proving to be a little chilly in the winter, so um, which is great because that means I can wear all my wool sweaters. Um, so this will probably be more of a spring-summer kind of piece. Um, but I'm still happy to have, have it in my wardrobe. Um, it's nice to have options. And then the other two things... Um, that I have made finished recently are over on my bed, so I'm just gonna grab them. Okay, so um, it is December, so it is clearly winter again in Alberta, um, and I decided that I needed a new hat uh, a few weeks ago month ago. Um, so I cast on, I grabbed some skeins of sport weight yarn that I had kicking around. Um, this is a skein of Rauma Phenol PT2. Um, I don't remember the color. I'll put any of the like color information I will definitely have in my show notes, which are always in the doobly-doo slash description box. Um, uh, even if I don't remember them offhand. This one I grabbed for the cream. I had some leftover Briggs & Little Sport, um, and then I paired that with the Rauma Phenol. This pattern calls for a DK, but I figured the gauge that it's knit at, I could achieve that with sport weight yarn. So, yeah, so I went for sort of like a, a low contrast um, color work, which I think turned out quite nicely. Um, I decided not to do a pom-pom. I didn't have a ton of yarn left. And I enjoyed knitting the hat so much that I made another one for my mom. Again, with a random skein of Rauma that I had in my stash. Um, and they combined with the same skein of Briggs and Little Sport that I had left over from a previous sweater project. And I have... have intentions to make a third one for my dad out of some different colors. Um, I just haven't quite gotten around to casting that one on yet. Um, I've gotten on to, I need some mittens, uh, which I'll explain in a few minutes. Um, and I think for needle size, I probably used, um, I don't remember off the top of my head what it would be. I think it's similar to what was written in the pattern, but I did find that the ribbing, um, when I first did the ribbing, um, on like the called for needle size, it was way too loose. And so the hat would just slip up my head as I wore it. Um, so I ended up cutting off the ribbing. So I like cut one stitch, unraveled a row, um, after having picked up all the stitches before that, um, unraveled the ribbing and then re it downward. And I ended up doing that on both hats so that uh, the ribbing would be better. If you want, I will show you. This one, this teal one, I ended up knitting a larger size, the larger size. This one was the smaller stitch count, um, simply because uh, my mom has a lot of hair, so she knitted something that was a little bit looser. Uh, 
Um, okay, so now hair is all nicely messed up. So that is like everything that I have finished since last time, which is not a lot. Um, but I have also cast on a bunch of things. Uh, one thing that I did participate in this year was the Stephen West Mystery Knit Along. Um, the m m mystery part of the knit along is now done, so I'm going to show you my shawl, uh, which is, I haven't quite finished it yet, uh, but I am on the edging border, border of the final clue, which does kind of go on for a long time. So this is my shawlography shawl. Um, I, I picked five colors out of my stash, uh, random skeins, and I kind of went, it's sort of this sort of like sea glass, uh, rainbow kind of color feeling to it. So, um, I'll tell you about the yarns. So I picked, this is a skein of Ocean by the Sea. I actually have two, two of my colors are Ocean by the Sea um, yarns. This one is Beachcomber on, I believe, her twist base, and this is Fleck colorway. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so three of these yarns are also naturally dyed. Uh, those two, and then also this is from uh, Woolly Mammoth Fiber Company in Northern Ireland. This is her natural sock base on one of her uh, indigo colors. And then um, I used this little acidy green is like leftovers from a sweater that I made a number of years ago. This is Zealana Performa Kiwi Lace. And it's actually like a possum cotton blend yarn. Um, so like the possum makes it quite warm still and like the cotton makes a nice contrast to some of the other yarns. And then the final skein is a good old Malabrigo sock um, that I've had in my stash for a little while in the Zarzamora colorway. So yeah, I have really enjoyed the shawl from the beginning and I really love how it showcases all the different color combinations um, and yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. It's just this last little bit. Um, I love how these stripes ended up coming out, this sort of um, bias stripe rainbow thing. Um, I just sort of ran out of steam sort of close to the end here. So, I mean, I could sit down and finish it. I just <sighs> haven't. Um, also because there's a lot of ends to weave in, so I know that that's gonna take me a minute or two, but that's okay. Um, yeah, so I thoroughly enjoyed this year's shawl, and it'll be, I see myself wearing this with my winter coat. Um, uh, my, I got a new winter coat this year, and it's, um, shades of gray in, like, a big plaid pattern, uh, and it's, like, a wool coat, um, so I think... It'll be like sort of lots of pattern, which I don't mind. Yeah, so that's kind of coming along, although it's been sitting for a little bit. I'll probably finish it over Christmas or something. Um, one thing that I have been doing like over my lunch hours at work is I took um, this project that I have had on the go for over 10 years this is um, something that I started in 2009. Um, it's a hand-pieced uh, hand -pieced English paper piecing hexagon quilt. Um, I have all these hexagons are already cut out. I cut out way too many back like 10-ish years ago. Um, and so I've been slowly piecing this together. This is, so I work on a piece that's about this size. Um, and then when this is all done, then I attach it to the larger quilt top that I have going on. And like, this is the last section at the bottom that I'm working on right now. So I've kind of, <clears throat> um, I did, so I pieced all of this at work. I can usually piece together like about four or five hexagons a day at work during my breaks, which is nice. Um, 
I'm just at the point where I need to baste more hexagons onto paper um, and I just haven't gotten myself organized to do that quite yet. So at work I've also been in my new project that I'm working on over my breaks is some Advent self-striping socks which um, I got really excited about Advent self-striping so the idea is that it's a 24 striped 24 striped self striping sock yarn with the idea that you knit sort of like a stripe a day or two stripes a day so that you end up with a new pair of socks for Christmas. Um, so I have that from three different dyers. Um, I got a skein from Woolens and Nosh and that's the one that I have at work so I can't show you that one. Um, and then the other two are the Cozy Knitter and the Wool Baron. So I have, this is the Cozy Knitter tag. And then, um, I don't know if I have the tag for the Wool Baron with me. So maybe I'll show you these socks next. These are, so I'm working all three pairs, two at a time. Um, and each pair I'm sort of doing a slightly different methodology, although I haven't decided yet if I'm going to do them all afterthought heel or not. So this one I'm working two at a time from the cuff down on double points. So I sort of pick up and do a few rows on one and then pick up and do a few rows on the other, trying to keep them kind of at the same point there. So we're sort of at the in-between point here. Um, and I'm, so these are on some prim double points. These are on a two millimeter needle, uh, also two millimeter needle, and these are some Haya Haya double points. Uh, yeah, so that's how these are coming along. Um, I'm like roughly up to date on my stripes, so I don't think that's any spoilers for anybody. So that's the Cozy Knitter skein. And while I'm at it, I might as well show you the Wool Baron skein. Um, so the Wool Baron, I didn't get her like official skein. Um, it's called like, Oh, What a Night. I got one of, I decided sort of spur of the moment when she announced that she had some like leftover skeins uh, that weren't quite the right um, colors. So um, when, when she put those ones up, I grabbed a couple of skeins. Um, and so that's what I've been working from. And most of these skeins had, I think all three skeins had a like start from this end. So I think I started from the right end. I'm not sure. The Woolens and Nosh one, um, I maybe started from the other end. I'm not sure. So this is the Wool Baron one. And I think I'm like just getting up to date now. So those are coming along. It's been a while since I've worked two at a time and then also toe up, um, but it's fun to change things up again, now and again. I mostly work my socks like one at a time these days, um, even if I am doing Magic Loop, um, but it's, yeah, it's interesting to work two at a time again and like, it feels so slow compared to like one at a time. It just, it feels slower. Anyway, but they'll be, you know, nicely matched socks. Um, and yeah, I'm the, I'm still debating whether I wanna do them all afterthought heel or not. Well, we'll see how bored I get by the time I get to where the heel should be. So, still have a few more stripes before we get there. Oh, and these ones, um, it's a little bit finer gauge of a wool. Oh, I do have, so this is the Wool Baron. This is her sturdy sock base, which is a 75% super superwash merino, 25% nylon. Um, yeah. And these ones, it's a finer gauge yarn, so I'm knitting it on a 1.75 millimeter needle. Um, and it's a chow goo. I don't know that there's much lots of options once you get into into the like US double zero um sizes. Okay. 
Um, something else. Okay, so those are sort of like newer cast-ons, and then um, I'm sort of going back to like when I made this sweater. I also cast on this next sweater that I'm going to show you, uh, which is um, out of. Uh, oh, do I even have a tag here? I don't think I do. I have a tag for a different thing. Um, this is out of Ritual Dyes Undyne, which is a cotton linen blend. Um, and it is also a fairly fine gauge wool. Um, but I still am able to knit it up at this like sport weight gauge. So it's, um, this is for the Darren Cardigan by Jacqueline Seaslack. And I am at the point of doing the sleeves. Um, I was just waiting for some double points, the right size double points to come in the mail. So I got those, I think this week, so I can continue on and put start the sleeves on the sweater. Um, again, because this is like summer yarn, um, the push to have this be finished um, is kind of gone. So it's sort of sitting, hanging out. But I don't know, yeah. I think I had only just cast this on when I, when I recorded last. Um, yeah, so it is, the body is done. And all the, all the um, ribbing is done and the neckband. So it's really just sleeves and it's finished. Yeah. So that's exciting. Um, and what am I knitting this on? So these, uh, I don't even remember. I'll have to look. So these look like I was knitting them on a three millimeter needle, which I mean, I only have one pair of three millimeter double points. And at this point, I think I'm using them in like three different projects, <laughs> which is why I ordered more needles. Um, yeah, so that is coming along. And this is, um, can't remember, I got like really jazzed about this idea of making a bunch of pullovers. Um, so I cast, I, and then when somebody on, um, the M to the third Slack group had linked to this pattern, which let me see, I will get, it is an Andrea Mallory pattern. Um, and it is the DRK Everyday Sweater. Um, and what I liked about this pattern, like, I mean, I think it's a really nice pattern. Well, it, it's a very simple pattern, which, I mean, Rockstar Designers putting out simple patterns. I, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, but what got me looking at this pattern closer is the yarn that she that she made it out of um is actually very interesting like it's a marled it's a two ply and each ply is like a slightly different color um so it gives this great marled effect and um i like i never usually like get mo motivated to like i want to knit this out of the yarn that it calls for but this was very tempting um, but I restrained myself from ordering another sweater quantity of yarn. And instead, I decided to pull out um, a languishing cardigan that I had cast on a few years ago. Um, some of you may remember me talking about my Earthsea cardigan. So um, this is a color of Jameson and Smith um, two-ply jumper weight. In, in this particular color, which I believe is 1280. And it's this insane, like, it looks kind of gray in some light and it looks kind of purplish in some light and it looks kind of greenish in other light. It's sort of like a blue gray color. It's kind of similar to the sweater that I'm wearing, but you can see how it sort of varies a little bit. So I kind of nicknamed this the Earth Sea Blue um, cause it seems like the sort of color a wizard would wear. Um, and yeah, this is, I mean, this 
sweater the sweater pattern calls for a sport weight yarn and I am knitting it out of a fingering weight yarn so what I did was I knit a gauge swatch to where I liked the the fabric and then I adapted um, I figured out what the stitch count would be that I would need for the sweater that I wanted for the fit that I wanted and then I found a size in the pattern that is similar to that um, and since this is knit top down I'm able to try it on as I go and um, the fit is good so far so that's how I'm doing this one and like it's interesting construction I mean you see a lot of simple sweater patterns that are um, raglans, right? This one's a little interesting that it's actually a round yoke. Um, I did knit another round yoke pattern um, from Andrea Mowry that didn't work out so well, so I'm paying a little bit closer. Well, it worked out fine, it's just the armhole was too low, so like the sweater kind of raises up when I lift my arms. Um, it yeah it's got sort of like swancho depth anyway so i paid a bit closer attention to the depth of my yoke um and ended up knitting a yoke depth similar to the the actual measurements that i would want for the sweater of my size um and yeah that's about the only thing that i had to pay close attention to um and otherwise this has been fun to just like knit a bunch of stockinette in the round um i have just started the ribbing and like my i'm still quite motivated to have like a bunch of pullovers and so i will get back to this it's sort of i pick it up now and again to just um work a bunch on So that's another project that's being worked on on three millimeter needles and 3.25 millimeter needles. It's like everything is in that range right now. And then the last thing, this is, we had a bout of um, cold Edmonton weather, which is like minus 17 Celsius, which I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, I'm sorry. Um, and I have some knitted gloves that I made several years ago that I use for when I'm driving to work. Um, but when it's like minus 17, it takes a little while for the car to warm up. Um, so my fingers have been getting cold as I'm driving. Uh, so I decided that I needed some mittens so that all my fingers could be together and keeping each other warm. So I started, uh, I again, went to my stash to see what I had in like sport weight yarns and I'm knitting the millet millet pattern from Isolde Teague um out of three or two skeins of Rauma and another skein of Briggs and Little Sport that I had kicking around and as you can see I have one mitten finished um I do need to modify this thumb is too long it just is. I'm going to try blocking it so that I know, I'll steam block it so that I can see how big it is. And I do find this is a little loose here, but um, I'm, I'm going to leave it because these decreases at the top are very unique. And so I'd have to probably re-engineer the whole thing to make it work for a different stitch count. Um, yeah. So let's see here, the colors that I am using. This is, I had bought some skeins of Rauma to like sort of check out some colors that I thought would be interesting to maybe get a sweater quantity of. Um, and I didn't end up liking them for that purpose. So they've just been sort of chilling out in my stash. So this is the Rauma Phenol PT2. Um, this color is 4023 sort of a teal um, and then the light color you can kind of tell it's not actually white it's like this very light pale gray um, and it is one of their heather colors uh, so the color number is 0403 so it's a very pale gray and so it looks kind of like dirty snow which sort of is fitting for, ugh. so 
sorry about that. My dad uh, brought breakfast. So there was a little pause and then I got wrangled into helping with the crust of a cheesecake um, as what happens. Um, so I was talking about these mittens. Do I even remember what I said? I think I told you the colors and stuff. Um, yeah, so two skeins of Rama and then the, there's sort of little accents of this gray color are done in this Briggs and Little, which I think is just called like medium sheep's gray or something like that. Um, it's a yarn I've, it's a skein I've had around for a long time. Um, I've been using it a bit in my advent blanket, my advent star blanket. Um, so it's just been around and yeah, it's like a nice little accent. The interesting thing about these gloves is it has this folded cuff. So you start with the color work cuff and then you knit, um, knit one, purl one rib for a, a number of rows. And then you turn, you sort of break all your yarn and then turn it inside out and start knitting the other way to knit the mitten. So you have this nice color work cuff, but you still have the ribbing so it stays close to your wrist, which is pretty smart. Um, yeah, so these are like nice mittens, nice clever mittens. Um, I think I'm using the called for needle sizes since I'm using the pretty much the called for yarn. And yeah, I just, I have to, I have to continue on with the second mitten, which I have like, I'm just casting on right now. So I will do that um, later today. We'll get going on that second mitten. Um, yeah, so the ribbing I am doing on a 2.5 millimeter needle and then, and I'm using double points for this. Um, and then a three millimeter needle for the body of the mitten. And I find that I have to knit on double points. I can't do magic loop because I end up getting these like, um, I mean, you can kind of see where my needle join was here, but that will definitely block out. Um, something that happens when I do magic loop is at the edges of the, where the, you sort of flip for the sides. Um, somehow my strands just get really short there and it like does not block out. So I go old school and use double points for when I'm doing color work in the round. Yeah, so that is everything that I'm knitting. Um, I might knit some uh, some little small Moki Moki Land ornaments um, as some gifts. Um, I haven't decided if I'm going to do that or not. I kind of, I mean, I have to find the yarn for that because I'd like to just use, it uses such small amounts of yarn that it doesn't make sense to be buying yarn for that. Um, I just have to figure out which patterns I want to make for people. Yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, work uh, has been good. Um, I work in a public library, um, helping people. Uh, so I'm sort of like the customer, a customer service person at a public library. Um, so helping people use technology, find books, um, all that kind of stuff. So that has been, so it's been since the beginning of September and we're now in December. So that's like three months. Um, and it's been really interesting, compelling work. I've really been enjoying it, even though it's not always the easiest. It can be challenging working in public libraries, um, which I think anyone in a public library will tell you that. Um, but it can be really rewarding too. Um, and it's kind of nice, like being in customer service where you're not like trying to sell people things, right? Like it's really nice to, to work in a place where it's like, well, I, you know, take all these things out. They're free. 
So I absolutely love seeing people come get a stack of books or movies or CDs or whatever we have and, you know, check out the maximum every time. Um, I just get such a kick out of that. And like we have families that come every week to do that level of looking at things, uh, checking out materials. So yeah, that's the kind of stuff. Yeah, it's just, it's great to see. I mean, I'm biased, but I think libraries are pretty great. Um, so I suppose I should talk about what I've been reading. I don't remember all the books that I've read since last time. Um, the library where I work, um, they have a shelf where they, uh, but bestsellers are available for like a one week checkout. Um, so I have, there was a book called The Paper Palace that I took out and read in a week. Um, which was quite the challenge, um, but I did it. And it was a, like, really good book. It's um, the first novel by the author, whose name I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, and it sort of, it follows sort of the family history of this one family that owns a property in Cape Cod, and they go back summer after summer after summer. So it's about... Um, it's a little bit about their life in New York City, um, but it's mostly about their time out growing up out at this um, country property. And um, yeah, so I mean, it does have a uh, sort of trigger warning of uh, like sexual abuse. Um, it doesn't go into great detail um, about those scenarios. Uh, not to the same extent of like a little life does, but, um, it is in there. Um, and so you, you start off, um, sort of not liking the main character. And then as you find out more about the family history and everything, then you sort of start to understand them more and become, and they become a more sympathetic character. So yeah, so that was a very compelling read. Right now I'm reading Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zauner, which is um, her memoir about um, her relationship with her mom um, while her mom is sick, um, dying of, uh, I think, pancreatic cancer. So it's... Um, I have to take it back to the library in a couple days and so I'm trying to finish it but it isn't the sort of book that you just like devour um I think also because of the emotional topic of it so um yeah but at the beginning it was really making me like crave Korean food um uh yeah which I haven't had a lot there there doesn't seem to be as much maybe it's because I haven't found it yet but like um, there's not as much prevalence of like Korean in Edmonton, it seems to me, although that could also just be because my parents, um, my, are not super adventurous with food. They're somewhat adventurous. Like they, you know, going for sushi is sort of part of their regular, uh, established practice, but like going for Korean food still sort of is new to them. I haven't quite gotten them going for ramen, although there doesn't seem to be a lot of good ramen here in Edmonton either. So, um, what else have I been reading? Um, I read The Salt Path, which was actually, was excellent. I think I wasn't, I think I might have been given it a sort of mediocre review uh, when I first was reading it. Um, but I think I just wasn't in the headspace for what the book was. Um, and it's actually the salt path and the companion book, um, the wild silence, I believe, um, uh, were both very excellent. And like, by the time I finished the salt path, I was raring to go for the second book. So it's a mem, they're both memoirs of, um, this, um, sort of retirement age couple um 
in the UK who find their circumstances that they end up being um, losing their um, like going bankrupt and losing everything um, just at the time that their children are in university and um, and so they find themselves homeless in the UK um, and unable to um, and needing to sort of start over from scratch so in the salt path they end up going on this epic camping trip um, wild camping in the UK along um, the southwest coast pass path which goes around sort of the the southwestern um, tip of England so like way over in this corner um, and it starts like at the base of Wales and it goes all the way around the coast um, and like it's is it so it's sort of like camping but also a little dealing with the realities of being a newly homeless person, homeless group um, in the UK, and like you're not really supposed to be wild camping in these areas. England doesn't allow wild camping. Um, but so, so sort of trying to find camping spots in places where you're not gonna be disruptive or um, disturbed. And so it's like a combination of beautiful, beautiful landscapes and um, dealing with the realities of um, being homeless in England. And oh, and also the um, the husband of the couple uh, is diagnosed with this debilitating degenerative disease, and so he's also dealing with that while they're camping um but actually the camping somehow gives him strength and so that he's able to um he doesn't feel the effects of his disease as much so and then by the end of the book um it ends well and they have sort of hope for the future and then in the second book it sort of talks it's like what happens after that so and um, and what leads up to um, the wife ending up writing the story into uh, first an essay for um, a magazine that homeless people sell in England um, that talks about homelessness in England and uh, about their experiences as like homeless campers um, and then writing the book which is The Salt Path. So. That was, it doesn't have the same kind of arc as the first book does, but it's still really nice to be able to sort of see, um, to get insight into like what led up to her writing down the story and how that impacted their lives for the future. Um, yeah, so, and uh, like uh, as a pu working in a public library, uh, we end up dealing uh, with houseless people in the Edmonton area. Um, so I've been doing some training to learn about that. And one of the things that I really didn't appreciate is like the majority of people who go to homeless shelters are only, are, are only, um, are experienced homeless for a short period of time. So, um, I think it's like 50% of people in homeless shelters only are there for a few months at the most, right? And if, like a few weeks to a few months. And then another like 40% are there for possibly a year. And there's only like 10% that are what are considered chronically homeless. And so they have... Um, they're sort of this stereotypic what we think of when we think of homeless people um, that um, that are there for longer than that who who have difficulty um, integrating into society I suppose is a way of putting it um, yeah it's kind of like all the euphemisms that we 
use. I don't know that they're any better than just saying things outright. Um, anyway, I it's I, it's like a touchy subject talking about um, people in those uh, who are experiencing homelessness. People who are experiencing homelessness. Yeah, without. So, um, so I was, n it, it was compelling to read the salt path and to get insight into that experience and then following it up with this other, um, training that I did, um, to sort of gain more insight into it. Um, yeah, the, the rea uh, anyway, so it's just like interesting things to think about. I don't know that I'm, I'm obviously not very articulate about, like what I've learned from these things. I'm still sort of processing it. Um, but I do really appreciate like reading, um, getting, well, getting insight through reading uh, people's experiences. Um, and so like the salt path, it's, it's somewhat, I mean, like you can link parallels to the book Wild by Cheryl Strayed, but it has a very different perspective simply because these people are at a different point at their life and they don't have the same, they don't necessarily have the same vantage point of like hopefulness for the future, right? Because, um, because of the degenerative disease, uh, because they have to start over from scratch at, at a late age, um, you know, feelings of they're too old for to be doing the sorts of things that they're doing. Um, cause that's what society sort of ingrains in people. So they're like too old to be starting over. Um, and yet despite all that, they're, um, they're able to sort of get back going on their feet. So yeah, so that was, I enjoyed that. The other thing that I've been reading is the Practical Magic series. Um, I'm only partway through the second book. Uh, these are a series of books by Alice Hoffman. So she wrote Practical Magic many years ago and it was made into the movie with um, Sandra Bullock and... Um, oh gosh, now I'm gonna forget the other actress's name. And maybe you're screaming it at the screen. Um, yeah, it's out of my head. Anyway, um, that very famous redhead actress, uh, Nicole Kidman. There you go. I got there. Um, yes, she is also, uh, she's also in the movie. And, um, yeah, the book was really fun to read and I read it quite quickly. Um, it's, the first one anyway and then the second ones were have or the the following books I think there's like four um were written many years later so I think the one that I'm was sort of halfway through right now was written a couple years ago and then I think every year since there's been a follow-up one and they tend to the one that I'm reading is about like the ants from the first book that they go to visit in New, in New England, um, who have the, the house. So like the Stockard Channing and Diane Weist characters from the movie. So it's about them when they're sort of realizing their magic as teenagers. Um, and yeah, and so it's sort of like a series of going further back in time kind of books, uh, from my understanding. And apparently they're making a TV series which is what prompted me to, of these sort of prequel scenarios, so that's what sort of prompted me to, to read all of these books. Um, yeah, so I'm slowly making my way through that book, although I had to pause it so that I could read Crying in H Mart. Um, one thing that I found is, like, I don't have the time to read, um, books as quickly as I did before when I was, strangely, when I was, like, a student, uh, you know, work from home student, I had more time for those things. But I mean, I was also studying part time. So I had more time in general. But yeah, it's sort of an adjustment. Um, still an adjustment. But uh, yeah, things are sort of falling into a general rhythm. Um, yeah. 
and I will get, I don't really have much vacation time, but, uh, yet, but, uh, I will get a bit of a break over Christmas, which will be nice. Yeah. So that's how I'm doing. Hanging in there. Probably going to cast on like seven more things this weekend because that's just where I am right now is like casting on a bunch of stuff and knitting it just because there's too many things that need to be knit. And yeah, enjoying my advent life. Um, I'll, this year I have like kind of one and a half advent calendars. I have a tea advent from a local um, tea company called the Tea Girl, um, which has been pretty much really delightful. Um, if it's a black tea, I make it as my morning tea. If it's an herbal tea, I'll make it as like a second pot in the evening, afternoon, evening. Um, and it's quite nice. And yeah. And then I also got a 12, it's like a 12 day, 12 days of Christmas, 13 days of Christmas advent calendar from, uh, Kalia the Luddite. So it's not necessarily like Christmas themed it's more like sort of solstice themed um and that yeah that's been fun so I've been sort of alternating I sort of every other day I open one of those which has been nice and it's all like um naturally dyed yarns from like kitchen scraps and stuff that is available at this time of year which I believe is mostly like her kitchen scraps which is kind of cool actually um, yeah, so I'll probably integrate those into the Advent Star Blanket that I started last year. Um, I'll revive that project at some point, but there's too many other things I need to knit. I need to knit all these tiny ornaments all of a sudden, so that's gotta happen. And yet, uh, yeah, I will probably, though I like the... I follow, um, the Mochi Mochi Land Instagram, and so... Um, I, there's just something about all of her Christmas ornaments. I mean, I love all of her patterns. They're, they're very fun and they're like fun to knit little projects. Um, the, I've only knit one, but I really enjoyed it. And like all the other ones look like a lot of fun too. Um, yeah. So I just need to collect some tiny bits of yarn and get going on that. All right. So that's about all I have for you this time. Um, not sure when I'll be able to record again, probably in January sometime. So happy holidays um, for whatever you celebrate. Um, or even if it's just like a winter chill out hibernation time, I wish you a happy winter chill out hibernation time. Um, yeah. I have to decide a friend and a friend of mine and I want to like hang out and stream a movie together. So we have to figure out a, how to do that and b what the movie's going to be and see when that's going to happen. So we'll figure that out. And yeah, if I don't see you happy new year. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.